Good day, everyone, and welcome to Deep Dive Being with Bears with Megan Walla Murphy. This is one of SSU's Dig Into Nature Spring 2022 educational series. It's also presented as part of SSU's Biology Colloquium for students. Welcome, members and, and students alike. My name is Margot Rollins, and I am a program coordinator with the Center for Environmental Inquiry. I'll be your host today, so let me know if you need anything. We want to take this time to acknowledge, honor, and make visible that our preserves are on the ancestral lands of Native peoples. We encourage you to learn more about this at cei.sonoma.edu. Personally, I am speaking to you from the lands of the Central Pomo in Southern Mendocino County. This spring marks our return to events on the preserves, but we're continuing to do some virtual ones because of a high level of interest. Can everyone please take a minute to type his or her name into the chat? This is our sign-in sheet. Thank you. As I mentioned, our presenter today is Megan Walla Murphy. She's an author, educator, ecological consultant, and lead of the North Bay Bear Collaborative. She will tell us more about her work and her collaboration throughout the presentation. Before she gets started, let me just tell you a bit about the center. We are here to empower students of all ages and all disciplines to solve the environmental challenges of the North Bay, to turn education into action. We provide direct outdoor learning experiences on our preserves, Fairfield Osborne on Sonoma Mountain and Ronard Park, the Galbraith Wildlands Preserve in Southern Mendocino County and Los Quilicos in Kenwood. We provide classes, workshops, and tours that focus on experiential learning and skill building. Additionally, we make the SSU preserves open to anyone interested in education, research, or creative inquiry. Inquiry is the important word here, and we will assist you in whatever way we can to satisfy that curiosity. What we do at the center is mobilize faculty, students, and community members to solve these complex environmental challenges that we talk about throughout our educational series. Again, turning education into action. We invite you to join our diverse community of learners and problem solvers, no matter whether you have any connection to the university or not. And because all sectors of society and all parts of our community are needed if we're going to be successful in solving these environmental challenges. Today we're going to focus on bears, and when you're finished, with, when we're finished with the presentation, we want you to leave today with a better understanding of our connection with the environment, and with new or, or honed skills that will help you contribute to sustainable solutions. If you have clarifying questions, please put them in the chat, and I will ask them to Megan as we go along. For other types of questions, she will pause partway through her presentation to address some of them and then answer others at the end and be available on Zoom for 15 or so minutes past the hour. Because this is part of a student class, Megan will pause at 1245 to take student questions. So students, be sure to put student in front of your questions so that we can prioritize your questions, knowing that you have to leave at 1250. So with that, I am very pleased to turn the program over to Megan Walla Murphy. Megan, take it away. So I like to start with this slide um, because bears are really good at teaching us um, lots of different things. So this was a mama bear and her two cubs. I have had the great opportunity of working in Yellowstone on a couple of different projects. And this time I was actually there just as a participant and person wandering around. And it was really early in the morning, maybe like 4.35 in the morning, right near um, summer solstice. And we saw this mom and her two cubs, and we were able to just pull up right along the road. And she, um, the cubs were playing, and then she just plopped down and sat down, and the little baby bear cubs crawled up and started um, breastfeeding from her. And it was so amazing that she was so close to the road, because one of the reasons, things that I've learned about my work 
um, with many different animals, not just bears, is that the animals have learned how to work with humans. And in this case, when she's in this very vulnerable place, as are her cubs, the road becomes a safety place because in Yellowstone, um, humans aren't a challenge, but other male bears and other predators are. So that was just such a cool relationship of like um, bear human road interaction that it, it was more of a protective place than a scary place. But my really favorite part about this story is she's sitting there and I don't have my own kids, but I do have friends who have twins and triplets and she and they've told me like, oh, when their kids are breastfeeding, it can get really obnoxious. Well, here this mama bear was sitting down there and the twins, they must have had their fill. The twin cubs must have had their fill. And they kind of started like nudging each other and you could hear them like kind of bickering, even though they were still latched onto her. Um, and you could then hear her growling and she was kind of like growling and like stop bickering or whatever and they didn't listen to her and one of them must have just nipped her a little bit too hard or did something that really irritated her and she just stood up and rolled and the cubs just rolled down the hill and they and they were fine and I thought at that moment I was like oh bears have so much to teach us because bears are excellent about teaching boundaries as we're going to see as we go on this journey um, and they're also really good parents so boundaries and um, parenting that bear mother thing is real uh, I we are also going to go on a journey of the North Bay Bear Collaborative which is a collaborative um, that we'll talk about that I began in about 2018 so here we go bears um, I spend a lot of time tracking animals um, in the old school way. I have used GPS collars and radio telemetry, but most of my tracking is in that kind of arcane old way of tracking by footprints and sign. I use it for a lot of my different um, research and learning about animals. And when I came upon bears, you know, they're always they cool. I'm going to mute this person. If you're not muted, that would be great if you could mute yourself. Um, so this was actually in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts. And um, some friends of mine were like, oh, you gotta come out and I'm gonna show you something about bears. And I um, went out and they were like, there's this thing called an ancestral trail. I've since learned that these ancestral trails are also called step-by-step -step trails, traditional trails, stomp trails. And we got out to the, and these are pictures of some uh, trails the one on the right I have found, the one on the left I poached off of Gmail somewhere or Google somewhere. Um, anyway, and what happens and when I, so we're out in the Berkshires and they show me this trail and what happens in these step-by-step -step trails or ancestral trails is that many generations of animals have, um, bears have stepped in each other's tracks, exactly in each other's tracks, for years and years and sometimes decades. And according to some people I've talked to in Alaska um, for hundreds of years. So they're almost like three feet deep. And the amazing thing is, and this has been caught on video is that when a big, let's say it's a big male comes to one of these trails and the steps are close together, he will shorten his stride to make sure that he is stepping in the same steps of all the generations of bears that have come before him. And he'll actually even pop his um, joints and his knees and his elbows and he'll like twist his foot. And then they've caught littler bears coming into these areas. And as soon as they hit one of these trails, they'll actually extend their stride to make sure they are stepping in the same steps. So these bears are accommodating to make sure they're walking in the exact same trail as all these other bears have before. So here I am in the Berkshires learning about this for the first time. And I start looking at this trail and instead of it going and taking the easiest route, because sometimes we hear like animals will take the path of least resistance, which I've found is not always true. Um, this trail was very circuitous. It would have been easier to get from the front, the start of this trail to the end of the trail by walking, walking in a straight line. But the bears instead were taking this very circuitous route, stepping in each other's steps. And at every time the trail turned where there was a tree, they'd slash the tree. And these trees were scarred and scarred over and scarred over, probably with decades of scarring. So I was sitting there and I'm like, well, what's going on? Asking my friends who grew up in the Berkshires. And they're like, we don't know. The bears just do this. So I've started doing a lot of research and there's a lot of speculation about why bears will create these ancestral trails. And um, some people say it's for food or reproduction. 
Um, but no one's really sure because they'll do it when the food isn't available or they'll do it out of season of reproduction. But the one thing I've noticed, because I've since found probably a dozen of these trails, is that when you walk into them, they're a little bit like when you go and you um, see a beautiful piece of art and there's like a hush in the museum because the art is so stunning or you're looking at a vista and there's a quiet on the land or you're in a um, like sacred temple or church, there's a hush on the land that happens. And it's the same thing that happens when you find these bear trails. There's a little bit of a quiet, there's a mystery, there's something going on um, that me as a human does not really understand. And that's when my whole world of bears blew up. I was like, what is going on? I really wanna understand these creatures. So um, I'm gonna share with you the little bits um, that I am learning to understand and understand that there's much that I don't know. So um, here are the two bears that are found in North America. Most of these photos, this, if you can see my cursor, the bottom left, the, and then all the color photos over here on the right, those are all our black bears. Um, over here in the top left, this is a mama grizzly and her two cubs in Yellowstone when I was working there. Um, and grizzlies were the bear of California. Uh, Sonoma County, Napa County, and pretty much south was mostly grizzly country. Um, the only black bears that were historically found in Sonoma County were up in like kind of the north um, west, like Gualala, Annapolis, and then on up into Mendocino, Humboldt. And they were certainly in the Sierras, they like forested landscape. But Sonoma County was predominantly a grizzly country. And the yellow here is showing the historic range. The orange is pretty much where they are currently. Um, and they also went way down into central Mexico and all the way up through Alaska. But due to a really intentional and deliberate, uh, basically massacre and torture, the last grizzly bear in California was 1924. And there's many, many reasons that they were killed, including food for the gold rush, entertainment, poisoning for life of, life of livestock and, you know, sport. But it was a practice all over California. This is the only place we get to see the California grizzly anymore. Although there is Monarch, she was um, one of the last California grizzlies and she I believe is in uh, storage in the California Academy of Sciences. So here we are um, in present day and here is the American black bear range in California. Um, it's being amended to include some other places in these coastal mountains where the bears are getting a little bit closer, but this is a pretty good geographic range of black bears, although I did just hear maybe um, a bear in the Santa Cruz mountains, but we'll see how that pans out. Um, here, as we can see, this is the most current data that California Department of Fish and Wildlife has. Um, they haven't really been doing a population estimate study across the state in, in several years, although they are starting to. But as you can see, the trends is upward and onward. They're about, you know, anywhere between 40 and 45,000 black bears in California. And um, they are reproducing well and dispersing into new areas and recolonizing areas, as we'll see. So I grew up in Southern California um, in those coastal ranges down there. And I now live in Occidental coastal ranges up here, the land of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo. I get to live right on the divide of the Russian River and Salmon Creek. Um, and there are bears here. So I moved in 2012 and there was a bear sighting in 2013, just not even a mile from my house. And I was like, yeah, got bears where I'm living. That's exciting. Um, and a friend and colleague of mine, Jim Coleman, he is a grassland um, ecologist and he lives at the Arts, Occidental Arts and Ecology Center and this young juvenile dispersing male came through. And what I love is there was this big five gallon jug of fish emulsion and this bear just ripped the top off and drank the entire um, five gallons of this fish emulsion. I cannot imagine what belly was going on. But as you take a minute to read this quote, what I really, really want us to understand and what I love so much about this quote is how Jim talks about our fridges and freezers and gardens, um, our coolers, all of that from a bear's perspective, perspective is just part of our ecosystem, right? They're not separating where the food comes from as being part of their world, right? It's all the same. So it really behooves us to figure out um, 
how do we deal with this much larger animal on the ground? And they've got five fingers, they're very, or five toes, and they're very dexterous. Um, and they are great at humbling us. So as we go on, let's keep going. There was more bear sightings in 2014 until really bear sightings are the norm. I get easily one to two um, calls almost weekly about, oh, I saw a bear, or here's bear scat, or here is bear tracks. And um, we're coming up into dispersal season. So starting kind of May, end of May, all the way into July, these young male bears typically, although the females will move, are dispersing. And then the sightings really go up and I you see them in the newspapers and all kinds of stuff. So the bears are here, and now we're gonna get into a little bit of the biology and track and sign of them. Uh, their colors range from black to blue to cinnamon to brown. Um, even if it is a brown bear and the color is brown, it is not a grizzly bear. It is not Arcto or Ursus arctos. The black bears, even with all these colors, are still Ursus americanus. They tend to have a much lighter muzzle than the rest of their body. The females can get up to 250 pounds. The males are big, and we have some big males in Sonoma County in the North um, Bay area. Uh, there's one um, that was had to be euthanized because it had broken hips, and it's sitting in a cooler for us to do a necropsy on, and it's easily 400 pounds. We need a forklift to move this bear around. And in the wild, they have quite a long lifespan. So they do have these generational legacies and deep relationships that they form, um, certainly with their landscape, but also with each other. Gonna look at a little track and sign now, which is what I love. So this is um, what a bare foot looks like. These are grizzly bare feet. I actually don't have black bare feet. They look very similar, um, black bare feet, except the claws are smaller. Grizzlies are predominantly really amazing diggers and will turn soil over and churn things around. Um, black bears, they do dig, but not to the degree that grizzlies do. So if you can imagine this with shorter claws, that's what a black bear foot looks like. These are the hind feet. Um, sometimes if you're looking at them in like sand, it'll look very similar to a human footprint. The front feet, you're usually just seeing this kind of kidney shaped pad with the toes. And sometimes you get this proximal pad there. But so what I want you all to do right now is just start to pay attention to your feet, put your focus at your feet and wiggle your toes around and now wiggle your big toe. So all your focus is on your big toe. And now in your mind's eye, take your big toe and put it where your pinky toe is. That's how it is for a black bear. Their largest toe is on the outside of their foot. Um, so that helps if you're trying to discern right and left front or trying to figure out individuals. Tracking them, um, for being such a large animal, it can be really subtle. If they know you're in the area, they can be so quiet and sneaky and won't break a branch and, um, and they're gone before you know it. So right here is actually a black bear track. This was of a pretty big male that I was following, but um, they have flat feet just like us. So they don't always leave a lot of sign. Here are some claw marks. Here's another little bit of the pad and the toes. Um, this one's a little bit more pronounced. Really, when you're tracking, and I'm telling you all this because I'm hoping um, you're going to get out there and do some leg work for us, um, you'll get this kidney pad shape. That's usually what I pick up on first because the toes don't always show up, and you sometimes will get the claws way up here. And then on the best of days, you're like, yeah, look at these beautiful tracks, and you thank the bear for stepping in good mud um, so that you can learn to follow them. They also, um, in dry season, they're moving through a lot of grass. My friend here, Lisa Moulton, who's an amazing tracker, she's pointing at the footprint of a bear. Um, these tracks look very similar to human. If a human was to walk through here, um, it would be hard to discern if it was bear or human, which we'll get to later about that bear-human interface. Um, one of the greatest ways to track bears is to find their scat. They leave a lot of it. They are incredible seed dispersers, so important to our ecological functioning of spreading native seeds around and food seeds, really good. They eat a lot. They are perfect food collectors. Um, I like this picture because it just tells a story, which is what's so fun about tracking. Tracking tells us what this bear is doing. So um, where'd my cursor go? So up here, this is the left front, here's the right front, uh, right hind, left hind, and then here's this big old scat. And so you can just imagine the bear standing there, all four legs. 
Um, and there's a close up of the scat with a little mushroom growing through it. Again, here they, here is this bear, and this was a large um, male bear. I'm up in Modini Mayakama Preserve and kind of near Geyserville. And as you see, um, this is if a human was to walk through here, it would look just like this. So I was following this black bear, seeing what I could learn from it. Um, and we came on this old cattle uh, bathtub that had been left in the meadow. And I was like, oh, from far away, I could see that we were headed to that bathtub. And I was like, oh, wouldn't that be funny if this bear got in the bathtub? And sure enough, um, this arrow is pointing at this, which is hair tracks of this bear, which had gotten into um, the bathtub, made it all muddy. But what I love about this, well, one is that bears love to relax. They love to bathe and um, just relax. But this bathtub, when the bear was sitting it in the position that it was sitting, it was looking over this most beautiful vista of the Santa Rosa Plains and Healdsburg. And you could see the coastal mountains. Cause I was probably only a couple hours behind this bear. And so he was probably watching, you know, as the sunrise was coming over the crest to the east of him. Uh, so just so great. So the bear was hanging out in the bathtub and then proceeded on. And I, I didn't ever catch up with that bear, but I learned a lot from him. Bears eat just about everything, or they will at least taste everything. This uh, bear scat up here is filled with grass. In spring right now, that's what the bears are eating. They are just chomping on forbs and uh, wildflowers and grasses and buds. They are great lawn mowers. Down here are pin cherries, um, a scat like that. This are, um, maybe you can tell, but these are those little plums that start to be ripe probably around June. They might be a little underripe, really mid-June they're um, coming on. And they're kind of that orange, red, yellow um, color. And they're, I don't know, maybe the size of a ping pong ball or smaller. So this bear, um, was walking down downtown Santa Rosa, walking down Stony Point towards, towards Third Street and hooked a right on the Santa Rosa Creek Trail, um, which lo and behold is a wildlife corridor. And what we're finding is those corridors work and the bears are most likely coming out of the Mayacamas, walking down those riparian corridors. And then they pop up and they realize they're in the center of Santa Rosa. And they're like, oh shit, literally, oh shit, what do I do? And then they um, make their way, hopefully either continuing west into West County and the open spaces there or back up into the Mayacamas. In this case, it was a young juvenile and um, so he did get spotted later. And these scats, you can see, if you can imagine eating, you know, each one of these probably has at least a hundred pits of those plums a hundred unripe plums. And these two scats were no more than 50 feet away from each other. So, you know, that's 200 unripe plums and what that does to your belly. Um, and you see it coming out in the scat. Here's a little, I think this video will work. Just, it's gonna get a little wonky while I'm zooming in here. This is in Yellowstone. Um, but what I like about this is, it shows the bear being really selective about the forbs that it's eating. Bears have an incredible ability to um, sense and taste. They definitely have preferences and they will move through areas hitting what they like the most if they have the ability. They will eat anything, but they are definitely um, cherry picking their favorites. They also like um, insects. I know, I think it was Lyle who's way interested in entomology, which is great. Bears and insects are really tied. This is a great sign. They'll come into these old rotten logs and just tear them apart and eat all the grubs that are in there, um, in the larva. They are also scavengers. Uh, this is actually a young bison here. You can see the horns, but they will scavenge. Um, what we're finding, they will scavenge mountain lion deer kills, and they will actually push the mountain lions off of their kill. We, uh, I first heard this reported when I was working in Colorado. I was working at the same uh, location with a, wild, um, a cougar researcher, and he was finding this over and over again in the mountain lion research he was doing. So that was when it was first started coming on my radar about 10 years ago, but Quentin Martins, um, is also finding like he will put some deer out to bait mountain lions or, you know, to recall our mountain lions and such. And he was finding that the bears would get there first and push the mountain lions off the kill. So we're now in this kind of conversation, are bears the apex predator in our area versus the mountain lions? Um, 
who knows? We don't know. There's so much that's open for mystery right now, but they do scavenge. Although um, meat is a very small percentage of their diet, probably no more than 15%. They are vegetable eaters. Black bears in trees, again, just like they are with the insects, are really dialed in. You'll see lots of different kinds of sign on trees. These are aspen trees. And all of these little black marks that almost look like hieroglyphics or artwork um, are climbing signs of the bears going, grabbing the trees, hoisting themselves up, grabbing the trees, hoisting themselves up. Um, you can see it just a little bit. These longer scratch marks are when the bear is coming down or kicking off. So um, really interesting that you can actually track the bears going up the trees. They like to mark trees also. So while there are feeding signs, there are also marking signs, a whole other kind of communication that they can get into. Um, so while humans are predominantly, well, now we're using our thumbs a lot and you know, have a lot of virtual communication, we predominantly communicate through our voices where bears are using um, scent signing and visual signing of which these claw marks are telling them. And we'll look at some other sign that they're leaving for communication. This is one, they love to bite trees, <laughs> which is crazy. So what's really neat about black bears kind of colonizing or recolonizing our area is um, we're, we're kind of on the forefront in this whole adventure. No one really knows what black bears do. And, in Sonoma County and further south because it was grizzly bear country. So we're learning a lot. Um, it seems that if there are Sergeant Cypress present, they target the Sergeant Cypress. If you've ever been around Sergeant Cypress, they have this incredible smell. And if you're an animal like a bear with a big long nose, who is basically mapping their universe through their sense of smell, targeting things that put off a lot of smell, help in communication. So in this case, um, this is Preston Taylor, a dear friend of mine who I go tracking. And um, he's also studied bears at Humboldt State and is now working for the Yorick tribe up in Northern California. And this is Ginny Fifield. She's um, a member of our collaborative and she also has worked with mountain lions. And we were out tracking um, bears and we came on the Sergeant Cypress where this bear had bitten the top of the tree off and then also took a bite out of it here. And you can see Preston holding the top of the tree. Um, this is Stephen Hammerick over at um, Pepperwood Preserve. And again, this is another Sergeant Cypress way out deep in the back country. And he's holding the top of the tree. And this is up close. You can see that there are um, claw marks. But over here on the right, if you can, the bear did break these branches, but you can imagine if you're this big, shaggy, hairy animal and it's hot and it's in the summer, because this was in the summer, that it feels really good to scratch your back against these sharp nubbins. It's like a back scratcher. And the bears love to take care of themselves. They indulge in pleasure. Like I said, they like to bathe. They play a lot um, and they scratch and kind of move around a lot. So this is... Um, are, uh, you can see the hairs here from where the bear was scratching up against it. They also, as I said, not only will they bite those small saplings and break them, they'll bite big trees. Um, and so um, if some of you can see me, if the tree is to their back, what they'll do is they'll back up to the tree and they'll turn their heads and then they'll take their incisors, top and bottom incisors and bite into the tree. And you'll see these marks. So that's a top incisor and a bottom incisor. Um, and they will bite into the tree on one side and then they pull out. So this is that being pulled out. Um, and they do this on telephone poles. Bears really like telephone poles, as do sometimes cats and things. But really, I think what it comes down to is it's a landmark feature that sticks out. If something is um, obvious to you, it's absolutely obvious to the wildlife. They're seeing it too. And it becomes like a gathering place where everybody's eyes go to. So the bears use them again for communication. So here's Lisa Moulton again. The bear bite is all the way up there. Lisa's about 5'10". So this bear, when standing on its hind legs, is well over six feet where it's able to bite. That is a big bear, folks. And um, that's that up close. You can see that there's an um, incisor, incisors, probably did it both sides and then pulled it out. And so they bite them, they mark them, they scratch them, they climb up them to eat them. And bears use trees as babysitter trees. When a mom comes out of the den, she has not eaten, um, depending on where she is, but 
at least in coastal California, has probably not eaten for two to three months. Um, and during that time, when she went to den up, she may have given birth. And at that time, the little ones come up and they breastfeed with her um, until they all emerge at the same time. And at that time, she is starving. She has not eaten. She hasn't had anything to drink. Um, nor has she had any waste coming out of her body. So she's anxious to get out and she's ready to eat. But yet she's got these like one or two pound baby cubs that are following her that are super vulnerable um, and need protection. And she's moving around by herself. She doesn't have another male there to help her. So what she does is she uses the big conifer trees, although the one, this is actually a picture from the Northeast. The one on the left is a conifer. Um, and she uses the big conifer trees, certainly in the North Bay region, and she, as babysitters. And I've, I've, I didn't see her slap the tree, but I've heard it. And what she'll do is she slaps the bottom of the tree and up the cubs go. Um, and they hang out on the top of the tree and they sleep and they can see all kinds of things, but they're protected. And she gets to go and eat and take care of her business and her self-care um, until she comes back to her cubs, maybe because they're crying or she senses they need to eat um, and she'll slap the bottom of the tree and down the cubs go. And it's, I gotta tell you, you're gonna die when you see a little baby bear cub in a tree because they're really cute. We do have reproducing populations in Sonoma County. We get all kinds of pictures of little bear cubs. I have yet to see one in a tree here though. Um, so we're, well, let me finish this piece about I guess, kind of keeping with um, bears and ecology before I open up for questions. I'll let you read that quote, but basically we're gonna drop into something called the anadromous nutrient cycle. The first time I heard about this, I was blown away. This is a great book about salmon. Um, we do right now live in salmon nation. I've had the great privilege of working with many indigenous cultures, certainly in California, but all around the world and starting pretty much right around Monterey Bay, all the way up into the Alaskan peninsulas. Um, the indigenous people here called a salmon nation. And bears and salmon um, are, again, we have bears and insects, bears and trees, and bears and salmon. Here's the anadromous nutrient cycle. Bears like to eat fish. So um, I have not seen this in play in coastal California, but this was up in Tahoe, and I'm just going to use the sockeye salmon and the black eyes there to illustrate what this anadromous nutrient pump is or nutrient cycle. Anadromous being born in um, freshwater, staying there usually for the first year of your life, heading out to saltwater, and then coming back to freshwater to spawn. These are the sockeye salmon, which are not native to Tahoe, but they follow that same cycle. But instead of going to the ocean, they go to Tahoe as the big water, and then they come back up into the tributaries. So here I am up in a tributary during the sockeye spawn. Um, and the, once a salmon spawns, they get ready to die. So the fish are a little bit slow, but they're still protecting the eggs that they may have laid or they're what they call gravid. They have a lot of eggs within them and they're easy pickings because the water's pretty shallow and the black bears come up in there and they grab the salmon and sometimes they'll just split the belly open and they eat caviar because bears love to eat good food or they'll eat the salmon. Um, and what they do, and this is where the anadromous nutrient pump comes in, is because there are so many abundant salmon, they can't eat the whole animal. So they'll eat the heads typically um, because they have, the brain has the most nutrients. It has a lot of fat in it. And they're so full, you know, these bears are walking around with these giant bellies and you'll see them kind of waddle around. Um, and they'll leave the rest of the carcasses there. So those carcasses, and this is where the nutrient pump comes in, are nutrients for all of these other species, for the birds and the osprey and the um, bald eagles and the foxes and the coyotes and everybody comes in. So there's just this flush of life that comes in during the cycle because the bears are pulling the fish out of the rivers and bringing them into the forest. The other amazing thing about it is um, that in doing so, they are also feeding the tree species. So does a bear shit in the woods? Pardon my French, but yes, they do. And they often disperse far away um, from the creeks and way out into the forest. And in doing that, um, they are taking these fish nutrients and marine nutrients 
out into the forest of which the forest and the trees have co-evolved with. I'm sleeping in a little bear bed right here. Um, and the bears were marking these areas where all the salmon were. And what's really incredible, and this just blew my mind when I learned this like 15 years ago, is that the marine nutrients that are carried up the rivers by the salmon and then distributed into the forest by the bears have been found as far out as in the forest of Idaho where those salmon spawning runs are happening. So the forests in Idaho, a good long distance from the ocean are showing marine isotopes within um, their woody structures. It's incredible. And we don't know what's happening because as we're seeing the decrease of our spawning salmon and our salmon populations, we have no idea what that is going to mean for the trees that co-evolved with these marine nutrients. So there's a lot of work being done trying to figure that piece out. And also with the decrease of our bear populations and the grizzly populations, what does that mean for the distribution of these nutrients? Lots and lots of work for you all to find out if you're a student, tons of PhD thesis is waiting, waiting for you. Go do it. Um, all right, I think this is a good place either for you to read the slide or Margo, if we have any questions. We really don't have any questions. We have a couple of comments. Um, well, why don't we hold the comments then? Okay. Um, unless they're, and, um, and then I'm happy to read the chats or go through them later, but. Um, That's fine. Okay, cool. So the other thing, um, oh, Alicia Nichols raised her hand. Go ahead, Alicia. Thanks so much. I have a question about nature pedagogy and biomimicry. With your experience in the field and working with other associates, which you shared today, what would you say would be um, a benefit of studying the behavior of bears, um, the pro-social behaviors, as well as the, obviously the behaviors for uh, basic needs? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we're gonna go there with this relationship between bears and humans. Um, so one, of, I mean, there's kind of the like pat answer that I could give you is it's really important to understand their behavior as far as coexistence goes. Um, as I'm going to get into the North Bay Bear Collaborative, our whole kind of not our whole mission, but a big part of our mission is that we do not become another kind of Tahoe Yosemite reality. Um, we want to make sure that the bears are safe and they're continuing to eat wild food. So understanding where they are and their behaviors and what they eat and what their food preferences are give us um, just a tremendous amount of information on how to take care of our wild spaces. Um, and then there's just this really interesting part about bears and humans, which I'm about to jump into. And if that doesn't answer your question, ask it again at the end of the talk, if that works for you. Great, thanks. All right, so um, hopefully you've gotten a chance to read this quote. And I wanna offer this up to you that um, if you have ancestry from the Northern hemisphere, all around the world, every country and continent, there were bears. Um, and so it is likely that somewhere in your ancestral lineage that someone was living with bears and knew how to um, either take care of the bears, take care of themselves or learn from the bears. And I've had this tremendous ability, as I said, to work with indigenous cultures, um, certainly around the Northern hemisphere and almost ubiquitously, they all say that bears taught them what the plants were to eat, um, what medicines to use, how to be quiet, how to make it through the cold. It's really fascinating. And this um, is every place I go, you touch on it, and there are rich stories and rich legacies of this. You know, here is an example of bear digging for roots, and then this is a young Karak woman up um, right along the California Oregon border. She is digging for osha root. Osha root is often called bear root. Um, it's in a medicine uh, for lungs and for bringing things up. It's a very, very potent medicine. There are many, many stories from uh, all the way from the Rockies over to the Pacific Ocean about that relationship of bear root and tribes, like all the way down into Southern California and all the way up into Alaska. It's really fascinating. Um, that legacy of animals teaching humans, but specifically bears teaching humans. Um, actually, part of that, though, goes to um, a fascinating thing of that 
If you were to, and this might sound a little gruesome, if you were to take the head off a human and the head off a bear and only look at the skeleton of a bear and human, they're almost identical with the exception of a few knuckles in the hands and feet. Um, the structure is really similar. So throughout these cultures, um, which it probably at one time were your cultures, there's a lot of story about the interaction and um, uh, shape-shifting of human and bear and bear and human. And there's beautiful books that talk about that. There's a really great book called The Sacred Paw um, that talks about how deeply our culture is intertwined with bears and bear behavior. Um, and it goes back, the Sacred Paw book even talks about our language, that almost any word that comes up in English um, or other European languages, that er sound actually comes from the sound that bears were making. So er, so major. Um, barren birth, all kinds of different things. Um, Megan, Megan, you have, you have about 10 minutes left. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to whip through this. Also in all of these places, um, there are deep relationships of bears and ceremonies and celebrating them all around the world. Um, this is a statue from Chumash bear culture. This is Haida bear, which is in the Northwest. This is an Inuit dancing polar bear from uh, north of Montreal. Uh, this is Japanese bear culture, again, Korean um, bear culture. The Koreans believe that every human was birthed from the great bear mother. Um, Russia and Siberia had deep bear cultures as well, and they are starting to become uh, reunited and invigorated with more attention going to indigenous practices and the importance of indigenous practices, which leads us here to the North Bay Bear Collaborative. Our website is beingwithbears.org, so you can check us out there. Um, when in 2018 we were starting to realize we had a residential population of bears in Sonoma County, uh, we got together a big group of agencies and we we're like, well, what do we want to do about it? And as I said, we really want to be ahead of this wave to make sure that bears um, don't become nuisance bears and that we don't all have to electrify our doorknobs and have electrified doormats to keep the bears out like they're doing in Tahoe. And Brooke Parkman, who um, is the retired California state archeologist really summed it out well with saying, how do we bring back a bear culture in Sonoma County? How do we remember um, what it is to live with bears and vice versa? Um, as I said, the bears are here and they're on a rise. This is just, I didn't chart it in 2021, but you can see during that dispersal time, the bears are here and we really, um, they're not just in the wild spaces, they're right downtown with us. And we need to figure out um, how are we gonna coexist with these friends? This is um, a slide of all of our collaborators. I feel deeply thankful that we have tribal participation, private landowners, vineyard owners, um, Recology, who are the, is the company that picks up trash, really instrumental that we take care of our trash in these places. Um, on and on, you can visit all of our collaborators um, on our website if you'd like. Um, and this is kind of some of the things that we are doing right now. We are not a formal nonprofit. We are a group of people getting together and taking action, fully grassroots effort um, of which I'm lead. So we're really interested in using um, bears as a touchstone for building diversity, both biological and cultural diversity. It is, there's a huge outreach pouring into, but we also have a lot of research going on. And I'll touch on that really quickly, um, just to make sure we get time. We have an ongoing mapping project. Uh, finally, we, got a, we have a full summer intern um, from a college on the East Coast who's coming out and he will be putting in, we have thousands of data points. This is just the few that we could get in um, that will really start to map where the bears are within the North Bay. And it will also be done by um, seasonality, time of day, and some of them we do have DNA on. So we'll be throwing that in there as well. Um, so we are doing a DNA project. We're out there training, you know, community scientists how to collect scat and um, drop it in. And then we're in a relationship with Dr. Ben Sachs at UC Davis, who is running all of our um, bear scat through his DNA analysis machine. And we're starting to figure out individuals. So in uh, 2020, we were hoping to get 16 sites done, but because of fire, 
um, we nine of our site nine of our 16 sites burned and so we were actually and because of smoke and hot days we we're only able to collect from four different areas um, in 2020 but even with that um, we had you know I think we had 173 scat samples and we had um, we were able to get a total of 30 bears the purpose of this project and working with California Department of Fish and Wildlife is to come up with a population estimate the collaborative on their own, we're going to be asking um, a lot of different questions that have to do with relatedness, dispersal, um, all kinds of different stuff, food preferences. So these were the plots that we have collected from in 2021. So we had a lot more success, uh, not as many fires last year. So that was great. We have 55 volunteers and we had all of these scat samples and these have not yet been analyzed they are still getting cleaned the data sheets are still getting cleaned up and they will go off to uh, Dr. Sachs in hopefully the next month. The reason um, also that this work is really important other than coexist not other than coexistence but alongside with coexistence is looking at what's going on specifically to our eco region. Um, I'll speak to Sonoma County right now, but it is also happening certainly in Napa and Marin, but Sonoma County, I was shocked. I grew up in Los Angeles County and I had more access to open space in Los Angeles County than I do in Sonoma County. Sonoma County, depending on who you talk to, is between 90 and 95 percent privately owned. Um, and so you can imagine with private, this is a picture of protected spaces. Um, and some of that is even still privately owned by nonprofits and such. But all of these places that are in gray are owned by um, vineyards or ranchers or timber companies or private landowners. Um, it is also Sonoma County, the most um, parcelized county in California, um, by a far by like way more than even Los Angeles County, which is staggering. So Megan, we're going to lose our students in, in just a few minutes. Um, okay, let me, I have one more slide. Okay. okay. Um, so given this with 64, um, with 64% population growth in Sonoma County, what we're starting to see is a lot more bear interaction and bear deaths, either through roadkill or depredation. And so as North Bay Bear Collaborative, we're really working on trying to create a way more friendly bear um, environment helping with the bears, helping the humans, um, and just figuring it all out. So that was it. Wrapping it up there. If there are students who have questions before you leave, it looks like most of the questions in the chat are not from students. Okay. I mean, um, I'm happy to answer any of those, so that's great. If there's any questions. Well, then let's, let's start at some of those questions and pick them off. Here, I can just go back to sharing my screen too. If people want to, whatever, that's fine. I'm just, trying to, I'm just scrolling through the questions now. Um, shoot, well, it was. Are there studies looking at how bears deal with burned areas? In other words, like moving back in or? or yeah, so that's a great, um, I wasn't sure, I didn't really have time to put that in there, but we are certainly looking at bears and fire. And in fact, all of wild, uh, all of wildlife and fire. Um, there is a group working out of Pepperwood, which I'm on the advisory committee for. And it's pretty fascinating. We're not really seeing a decrease in bears in those burned areas. In fact, I've been in some of the areas as soon as they've been opened within like a week or three weeks of the fire, and you'll see bear scat and sign. What um, we don't know is the long-term effect, but we're also seeing bear cubs and reproduction happening. Pepperwood didn't lose any bears within their area, and they burned um, both in the Tubbs fire and the Kincaid fire. Um, really what is happening is in these burned areas, we're seeing more diversity of food come up, which is phenomenal. A lot of those conifers that were um, crowding out food sources like berries, elderberry, the uh, forbs and tubers that they need are coming up. And it seems like there's a lot more diversity of food, which is amazing. Um, with that said, there are some areas where I'm seeing tremendous food loss, like uh, I was out 
in areas from the glass fire and whole um, sweeps of manzanita that don't crown sprout. So some manzanita crown sprout, some do not. Those are all lost and now they're just tiny sprouts coming up from a seed bank. So I don't know how long it will take for that regeneration to happen and that food source to come through. But the, um, a lot of my personal work is on habitat connectivity and wildlife movement through those areas. And so what, um, like nothing has ever shown me how important having large swaths of connected habitat is because what we have seen, not just with the bears, um, but with a lot of animals is that they will move out while the fires are burning and then will, and within weeks will come in. And it's the animals that are not having the ability to move out where the fires are, that they're the ones that are in trouble. So having a place to go when things are burning, just like with humans, you know, we, we all get evacuated and we leave and then we come back. Um, it's just as important for the wildlife. Any other questions? Question. Yep. Question. If I'm here. not answering your questions, you can unmute yourself and ask me. But. Yeah, you, you can. Uh, one of the questions here is, do we know why the bears in Sonoma are increasing? Yeah, so that's part of um, our research right now. We have a couple of theories. One is that it was grizzly country and they definitely have their own niches. Um, and so the grizzlies were shot and there was a vacuum left where, you know, I talked to the old timers and they're like, there are no bears in Sonoma County because they came after the last um, extirpation of grizzlies, but were before the recolonization of the black bears. Um, so I think, you know, that quote, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. I think black bears are filling into this area where um, they now have space. I also, um, I think, so, well, I know Humble and Mendocino counties have some of the highest black bear density in, certainly in California, but possibly in the country. And so I think natural dispersion is happening, um, you know, and it's pretty much a straight shot from uh, Mendocino National Forest right down the Maya Commas into Sonoma County. Um, and then there's some other speculations about because of fire suppression, we actually have a lot more forested area where we did have a lot more grassland and oak woodland. So, um, you know, as I said, black bears and the forest go hand in hand. So that's a specul. They're all speculation. We don't really know, but that's what we're trying to figure out through the DNA projects. Adam asks, do you think that reintroduction of grizzly bears in California could be ecologically and politically feasible now or in the near future? Excellent question. So I am um, in a lot of conversation with the uh, black or the grizzly bear, California grizzly bear project. Um, and that is an amazing question. So politically, I think it's going to be a very, very hard win um, for the bears. So, you know, as you see over and over with the wolves, you know, people are afraid of grizzlies there and there's a lot of hesitancy. They are amazing predators and very good at what they do. So I think politically, it's going to be a very hard win to reintroduce them. Ecologically, I think it is possible, um, especially we do have spaces up in like northeastern um, areas and the eastern side of the Sierras and such um, where it could potentially be possible. And then for me, beyond political and ecological, there's ethical too. And how ethical is it for us to bring an animal back where they may um, just be shot? It's a little bit to me like inviting someone over for dinner and then shooting them, right? Um, and so I think we have to work at it from a really good place of ensuring that we're bringing an animal back safely. If they recolonize on their own, I am way ready to support them and go to task with them or for them. But um, to bring them back is, is a different question and requires a lot of different work. I am hoping, so I'm 47 now, may it be by the time I'm checking out of this world that there are grizzlies back here. I mean, I'm seeing black bears and elk come back to Sonoma County. So I'm like, okay, um, and wolves too, but that's a great question. Thank you. I see Alicia has her hand up. Yes, I'm just really interested um, so more about just even the study of bears, how it could be applied to curriculum delivery for early childhood education. Like what would be the benefit of studying the bear for people that are building foundations for learning and also moral reasoning in your, in your thoughts? Yeah, wow. I, no one's ever asked me that question before. So let me think about it for a minute. Um, yeah, that's my thesis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
I would love to talk about you talk about uh, talk about that with you more, Alicia. So you're welcome to email me, um, and we can talk about it. Um, the quick answer would be: I think as we're seeing more and more um, humans fragmented from anything um, having to do with nature, you know, there's a huge loss and a break. Like habitat fragmentation is one thing, and then there's human fragmentation from our natural systems. And I, what I am blown away by is the amount of support that comes around with bears. There's an, um, an inherent and easy kindred relationship there for nature. So there's this bridge of bringing children and ideas into the wild um, and their roles in nature, um, which I find are really interesting. The relationship mama bears have with their cubs is really incredible, um, how they teach them that, you know, they have found that when a cub does not have a mom to raise them and teach them what plants and proper behavior and how to get in the trees and where the water is, um, often those cubs will starve unless we come in and, you know, or so another bear um, adopts them. So there's that whole piece, too, of that really deep mothering and teaching um, and relationship there. Um, I could probably come up with a bunch of more ideas, but oh, really, wonderful. feel free to reach out to me through my website and we can have a conversation about it. Um, Shelby asks, how has the salmon bear wood web, I think he means food web, been holding up recently around here? Is there still a concern about how the salmonid population is doing? Yes. Yeah, so right now, there that um, anadromous nutrient pump that I was talking about does not exist in Sonoma County. Um, our salmon are tanking and having a really hard time. Mm -hmm. Every day, we should all be out there dancing for rain right now. We did have a good year. And when I say good, um, we're talking about maybe 500 to 600 coho salmon came back and spawned. But as we know, no water, no fish. So whether those little um, fry and fingerlings are going to make it through the summer without more rain is going to be tough. But the um, so certainly there is not a salmon population to support a bear population, nor do we have that high of a density of black bears here. So um, where you really see it are places like up in Washington, Canada, Alaska, and then that uh, little tiny place that I was showing you in Tahoe, Southern Tahoe, you can go see that every fall, that relationship but in Sonoma County, it doesn't exist. I mean, let me, I'm going to ask one, one more question from the chat, and then Megan has graciously agreed to stay around for a few minutes, so uh, I'm going to wrap it up formally, but she's going to stay on board to answer some questions that you did not get answered. But the question here from Wendy is, would geotagging photos of bear scat in the county be of use to you as data? She has some of, it looks like, from 2018 and 19. Yes, that would be very useful. Yeah, so we are asking for photos of bears, of tracks, of scat. That's great. And if it's recent enough, um, like if any of you have scat that you're like, oh, I just found it yesterday. Uh, well, we actually can't collect in the rain, but as soon as we get into the dry seasons, um, it's we'll go out there and scoop up that scat. I can only imagine what the bears are thinking I'm out there doing. <laughs> Why is this woman playing in my poo? <laughs> But it's true, I do. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, Megan, so much. And, and please do, do stay around, folks, because her love, depth of knowledge is extraordinary. Um, but it is time to wrap up. And as I mentioned, this is just one of several events that we have offering uh, for free for the Center of Environmental Inquiry. There is a full listing at cei.sonoma.edu forward slash calendar. And I will put that into the chat. Um, but a few that are coming up are our next program is a virtual presentation entitled Building Resilience, Reliable Su Supply Chains. Oh, nice. And that will be on Zoom this Wednesday, day after tomorrow. And you can sign up for that uh, on the website that I will post. And then next week, you can join us on campus to view Embers of Awakening from Firestorms to Climate Health, a gripping, I mean, really intense film that explores how fire is changing the way we live. It'll be introduced by the director producer. It's free of charge like all the rest of our events. So please, please join us for other events. And meanwhile, you can stay on and, and chat with Megan. And thank you all very, very much for joining us.